hockey. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite. It's Judd's Hockey Show. And happy Monday to you all. It is Judd's Hockey Show. It is Judd. It is AJ. Jesse Pierce will join us tomorrow, of course, uh, for the full-strength edition of this fine program. Uh, before we start talking about what happened, what transpired at the X on Saturday in the uh, Dallas Wild game. Quick shout out to the exclusive personal injury law firm of Judd's Hockey Show. Then, of course, our friends at Nicolay Law. Law. N- Nicolay Law knows that when you or a loved one gets injured, ordinary life can come to a stop and things can get complicated during that time. Insurance companies are going to pressure you. They don't care if you get better. They don't care if your bills are piling up and they don't care that you may not be able to work. But the beard right there, Russ Nicolay and his team, they do care. And they've seen every play the insurance companies have. They'll make sure you get the compensation you deserve after an accident. So if you've been injured, get Minnesota's local award-winning injury lawyers. Get Nicolay. Start your path to winning at NicolayLaw.com or give them a call at 1-855-NICOLAY, N-I-C-O-L-E-T.com. Russ right there is going to make sure that you get exactly what you deserve. We appreciate him and, of course, all the sponsors of uh, Judd's Hockey Show. And AJ, without... Further ado, we were both at the game hosting a uh, suite, actually, a company suite on Saturday. Had a great view of that game. Mm-hmm. And I will say this. So the Wild loses 2-1. to one. Didn't have a yes. lot going for two periods. They were down Zuccarello, who's going to be out three to four weeks uh, after having surgery. I think we can all guess where after seeing the shot that hit him, unfortunately. Uh, Brodine was out again, upper body. And Jules Erickson Eck was out again, lower body. Um, now, both, I believe, are supposed to skate. Both Brodine and Eck are supposed to skate again today at practice. The Wild then embarks on a road trip that will start in St. Louis on Tuesday. Uh, the Wild, obviously, the storyline, age going into the game against Dallas, was the fact that against uh, Dallas, Colorado, and Winnipeg a year ago, three of the top teams in the Wild's division, Minnesota was a combined 0 10 and 1. So one point that clearly is not going to do it. And if you yeah. change that, of course, if you could go back in time, the wild almost certainly makes the playoffs. So two to one loss. Dallas is a good team Saturday night at the X. What was your takeaway as far as what you saw? Well, they were cl- they, Judd. They were clearly missing their top right winger and one of their top two centers. I mean, it, it it was very clear that they just couldn't really get into the motion of the Minnesota Wild brand of hockey we've seen here so far this season. It took two periods, and you saw it in the third really kind of come to life. Unfortunately, it, it was a little bit too late. Um, I'll tell you my positive takeaway, because I think okay. you and I, maybe maybe more so you, have been critical of this guy all last season, into the offseason, and now I think he's really making us eat crow. I think Philip Gustafson is the real deal. He bailed that team out multiple times the other night. We saw on the power play, Brock Faber, who I hate highlighting any mishaps that he has, but on the power play, the a drop, no look pass, just feet in the like feet above the top of the crease in his own zone. Yep. I believe it was Matt Duchesne, maybe, maybe it was Sagan who cuts in for a for a chance. Who's there? Philip Gustafson. To kind of break it up with a poke check, stop the scoring chance in what should be the easiest breakout of your own zone in the history of hockey. You're on the power play. There should be almost no pressure, but then you just drop it there. Um, there was a good outlet pass to Matt Duchesne, who still has the legs from his speedy days up in Ottawa. And then we've seen him um, with, um, who else was he with that had, was he with the Canes for a little bit? I, I, it Duchesne? doesn't matter. Col- yeah, Colo- Colorado. Was it Colorado? Ottawa. And then I want to say he might have had another stop. I, I feel like it was another this. red team, but I think it I, doesn't matter. Um, he had a breakaway. Guess who comes up big? Philip Gustafson. He's been so precise. He's been so tactile with his movements, reading angles. He has been a godsend for this team in net. And I know we have, I was at least expecting a slow start because that's what we kind of gr- have grown used to. Based on what Jesse has told us in past weeks, he came in more business-like. The attitude around him in in press conferences and just like interviews is a little different. This guy is the real deal. I'm fully bought into the goaltending on this team. I think Gustafson's the real deal. Duchesne was bought out by the Predators, so he, he Predators. Went from thank the, you. The Sens to the Preds got bought out. Dallas got a really good deal, and he's been good there. Uh yeah, I I agree. Um, and look, I was. 
I was at the forefront of saying trade him. You know, my assumption being that uh, Volstead and Flurry would handle the net for the 2024-25 season. I think the Wild did try to trade him. I don't think they could get a thing back. But as of Monday morning, recording this, Gustafson, second in the entire league in goals against, 2.08 to Casey DeSmith, who is the backup in Dallas, to Ottinger, who has a 1.79, DeSmith does, goals against. And save percentage, Gustafson is tied for second with Anthony Stolarz and old friend Cam Talbot, who he was traded for, 927. So, yeah, he's been absolutely magnificent. The two goals on uh, Saturday, do not blame him one bit. You are right. That is a big positive. Um, You're also right that they missed their top guys. Now, Zuccarello's out for an extended period here, so they're going to have to make do there. And I have a feeling... Uh, if Eck can return on Tuesday, I think we might see the reuniting of the Eck Boldy Kaprizov line, which was when, if you recall, John Hines actually broke up at that time the pass happy twins, Kaprizov and Zuccarello. And he put uh, Boldy, who loves to shoot, on that line. Eck was the center, and it was really good. I think we might see that line back. Uh, but, you know, as far as, as far as, that goes the wild is going to have to pick up some of the slack for Zuccarello being out hopefully Eck and Brodine are back soon I think it definitely impacted them what I will say though it was an it was an interesting sampling though watching the stars of just how competitive and good this division is and that game was close so the wild hung in there I'm not going to say, like, I would have liked to see more in the first two periods age, but it wasn't like, oh, my God, look at this. They're playing a good team, and it's a mess. And that was a very close game. And, you know, Boldy hit the the pipe with, what, 61 seconds left or so? If he scores. Yeah, a minute and some change. That's a tie game. So Mm -hmm. I liked a lot of of what I saw. I feel like this team is, well, one is, you're exactly right. The goaltending is really good. Um, at least from Gustafson. And there is definitely more of a structure and resilience here that I like. What did you think of the decision? Because I, I think that this was hotly debated in the press box as well. What did you think of the decision? It's short term, but I'm curious to get your thoughts on Boldy centering Johansson and Kaprizov because of the lack of of healthy players and obviously Eck being out changed it. Now, just for clarification, uh, Hines did go to Rossi replace Capri or I'm sorry, Rossi replaced Johansson, but Rossi became the center for Boldy and Kaprizov in the third period of that game. What, what, what did you think of that two period experimentation that actually started the previous game when Erickson got hurt? I mean, they were the best offensive line for the wild that night. And frankly, they should be. That's on paper, a, a supposed to be a stacked line. When you put Caprizov and Boldy on the same thing, they had uh nine minutes and 17, uh, 17 seconds of ice time on ice expected goals for a 0.435. That was the highest by far of any line combination um, in the night. The only, only uh, Somewhat close, Boldy Rossi Kaprizov that got three minutes and 52 seconds of ice time in the third that you reference. They generated 0.368 expected on ice goals for. So they, I mean, I think you had to do that. I just given the circumstances, I think John Hines was in the right. I didn't mind it. Obviously, is Boldy a top tier NHL centerman? No. And I don't think anybody's going to argue that he is. He's a top tier wing. Agreed. Yeah. But and he's a makeshift center that I think is capable enough for a game at a time in that moment's notice. Um, th- the biggest thing that I think you probably miss out on having a capable center yeah. is late in the first period. What was it? The Labushkin shot yes. March Marchman's first goal. Was it it's lost? just, it, it's just yeah. a clean win. It right. was the cleanest face off win in a while. Right. They went right back to the point less than a minute left. He fires one tipped out front goal. That, to me was the biggest thing that you're missing a defensive good face-off taker like Jewel Erickson Eck. He's going to tie somebody up. He has the strategy there to probably prevent or let a winger be able to get onto Labushkin so he maybe can't get that shot off as cleanly, has to pass it instead. That was the biggest thing, but I know it stands, stands out as a goal against, and that's the biggest thing people are going to take away, but I didn't mind goalie uh, Boldy excuse me, as a center 
given they they were missing Eric Sinek, and frankly, I didn't want to see like a Goudreau pushed up to the first line. I th- I think Rossi getting moved down to that Felino and uh, Trennan pairing was interesting, but it worked out enough. But then he reacted. He saw we have to change things up, and he got uh, he got Rossi to that top line eventually. And that's what I was going to say. To me, the key thing is Heinz adjusted it. Like like mm-hmm. that. That's the thing I keep seeing from him. He's not stubborn. And so he took a chance. It probably didn't work as well because when they made the move uh, the previous week in, in the game that Eck got hurt in against the Canadians, like the Boldy line played really well. Look, like he, and look, the Habs aren't good. I get that. But, yeah. you know, in that case, Boldy, Kaprizov, Johansson accounted for a beautiful goal and it worked out. He tried it. Didn't work great. To your statistical point, it was not, you know, some type of disaster. But then he yeah. switched it in the third. The team picked up. I like the fact that Heinz doesn't seem stubborn. I like the fact that he is, he seems very in tune with game flow. And so it's not like, no, this was my decision and I'm going to be proven right. It's like, okay. Um, and yeah, the lost face off hurts you actually could have argued that you could have tried to manipulate it to get a center on the ice and then bring yeah. that guy off on face offs and put boldy there i mean there are some ways that probably might have worked out at least in the case of the goal that you're talking about better but all of that being said i am fine with trying things as long as you are willing to say okay now i'm going to adjust it i actually here's what i liked here's what i liked the most and we were talking about this in the suite and this was actually my number one problem with that line. Boldy losing a faceoff that led to a goal, unfortunate, not surprising. But like he's still a really good player. Uh, that, yeah. take, that takes nothing away from him. Um, strategically didn't work. Here's my here's the here's the tweak I liked. They got Johansson the hell off that line. No, I'm serious. Because <laughs> yes, again, because no, right. <laughs> again, he had been and he would scored. He had the great pass to Boldy, which was really a Caprice House special against Montreal to score, I believe, was the first goal of that game. Mm-hmm. But I, we started talking about it, and it's like he's doing he's doing Johansson things again. Like, dude, you're on the top line. You mm-hmm. gotta do more here. And he didn't. And so what I really liked was that Hines said, Okay, all right. The adjustment is Rossi goes in between Boldy and Kaprizov. Yes, that's natural. But I loved the fact, and then I, I think I pointed this out to you. Now they sort of juggled lines after that, but at one point, like Johansson was on the fourth line because he just had one of those Johansson games. And I'm not mm-hmm. sure what what again the advanced metrics show, but eye test wise, I was like he's backsliding, and no one's got time for that now. So I liked that. I thought that was great. The other thing from a forward standpoint too, age, and he occasionally makes some plays that he grinds out, but I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, unless you disagree with me, Trennan being on anything above the fourth line is a poor decision. I I, I mean, they've tried to yeah. put him back on that third line. I you You would think, theoretically, that he would fit on a line with Felino, which they've tried, right? Yeah. But I I don't think he's even close to being as good a player as Marcus is. And that's not, I mean, Mar- Marcus can score goals. Marcus can play. He's a tough guy, but he can play. But, you know, and when Trennan's been on the fourth line, I've thought, okay, it's fine. Anything above that, I am so underwhelmed. I, my, it, 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 I want my head to pop off. It's bad, isn't it? Like, yes, it's really bad. Unless you can come up again with a advanced metric that shuts me up. No, I, I, I'd be looking for a while. I feel like, um, I'm as much as I love the details and stuff. You're right. It's the eye test that I think trumps everything. At the end of the day, the eye test that we saw on Saturday night is that that guy has to be on the fourth line because you can almost hear like the chains moving and the gears turning when he's heading up the ice. He gets up in the play. All of a sudden, it, sh- it, it transitions and shifts back the other way. And guess who is, you know, behind the play trying to catch up? 13. 13 and green. And it's just grinding to catch up. Like, his shift changes are painful. Like, the the one thing that you can see a lot more from the suites than the press box because you're far closer. So, like, you have a much better feel, in my opinion, yeah. for the game itself. 
And watching Trennan grind to get off the ice is damn near painful. It reminds me of my year in house league in eighth grade when I could barely skate and I had no business playing house league, you know? It's it's like I'll, it's the same for me when I fill in like um, my dad is like, hey, we we're, we're down a couple guys or whatever. Can you come fill in in our beer league? Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, they're like, oh, you're the younger guy. You're going to be out there. No, <laughs> guys, <laughs> I'm on a two minute shift here. <sighs> so, yeah, yeah, get out. He's like and, literally. And I'm not trying to be a jerk here or an ass. I'm just but the, but the problem is it's it's noticeable enough to where we have to talk about it. I he know ha- he has to be on that. You know, like. This was supposed to be your defensive penalty kill acquisition of the off season. You couldn't really do much. And I know there's probably reasons why they had to go with him. And they, you know, I'm sure there is stuff that they liked. And we, at the time, I was a fan of it based on what people were saying. I wasn't super familiar with his game, but I was told he's good on the penalty kill. He can win face-offs, blah, blah, blah. I, the the biggest thing we didn't talk about, the lack of speed, the lack of agility, no pep in that, in his step. It's, it's just it's like he's skating with cinder blocks attached to the backside of him. He's yeah. he's got something dragging him down. Like you have if you put him on a line, that fourth line, Husnadinov and Goudreau, Guess guess what? They're going to break away from him. It's basically going to it's going to be a two-man rush every time when you move up ice. If you put him on the third line, Felino is a better athlete than him. He's going to break away from him and if they have um who who would it be there on that third line now? I guess sorry, Lauko and Husnadinov on the fourth line. Yeah. If he's on the third line, Goudreau and Felino, they're breaking away from him. And if yeah. he's anywhere in the top six, we have a serious yeah. conversation about John Hines because oh, that God, is yeah. delusional. Um, yeah, yep. it's it's been a very underwhelming showing so far this season for him. And I know you mentioned this uh potentially the return and reunion of that Caprizov, Eric Snack, Boldy line. Yep. The line runnings from this morning's skate has that top line as a reunion with Johansson, Rossi, Hartman, line two, Marcus Foligno, Goudreau, Trennan, line three, and Lauka Husnadinov with Jones and Shore rotating on that fourth line. Oh, boy. Yeah, Trennan on the third line. I, I mean, I, I know that there shouldn't be a huge uh, discussion point of discrepancy between the third and fourth line, AJ, but I feel like there is. I feel like when... Yeah. I, I don't know if the fourth line is just specialized enough or not, because, yes, who, who's to Dina, uh, you know, is fast. Don't get me wrong. But it feels like it's palatable there. Watching him anything above the third, the fourth line, I'm like, I don't know how this works. It, do, it doesn't look to have any chemistry. And, I, you know, I think Trenton as a PK guy is okay because, again, that's a very slotted role. Um, you, you're not mm-hmm. going to get speed. You're not going to get a lot. But if he knows how to position himself. But, I mean, I am as underwhelmed. And, and this is not a – I don't think he's – I don't know him at all, and I don't. This might be an erroneous statement. I don't get the sense he's not trying. I just get the sense he's that slow. Like Johansson, I will at times question, and sure enough, Marcus will show you things at times, and it's like, oh, where's that all the time? Yeah. Well, he just doesn't do it. You know, he falls down in the corner on purpose so he doesn't have to do something. But you know, with Trennan, it's I don't. I'm not even questioning anything about what he's doing. I'm questioning the fact that I don't think he has any speed, and you know, I've never. I, I just I've. I don't know where this goes because you signed him to a pretty nice contract. And I suppose, you know, perhaps he's not in great shape and he'll get in good shape. I don't know on that one either. Uh, but I am I am astounded that this was the impact signing. And and I know it's going to be small, but I'm really, yeah. really surprised now. Yeah, I think I know we've both used impact as the word. And I well, it was probably more of like a splash or a drop to begin with. But, but he was their guy. But the, that was that was the signing of the offseason right. because they really couldn't do much else. What I will say, if you want to spin zone it a little bit, is that he is so late to the play getting up ice, especially back in his own zone, that he's seen the play develop already. And what I'll give him credit is he's a big physical guy. He knows exactly where he should be, which is in the dirty areas. He's going to go in and brace for that contact. He yep. did that on Saturday night. The play yep. is already essentially developed. So if somebody's low below the goal line and he can go throw the body around, guess what? He's going to go in there. So I'll give him credit to that. Yeah, He's not right. shying away from that. Right. Um, You're right. And we, we mentioned the face-offs earlier. Marin Hustandinov, if Eric Sinek is out, might be your defensive face-off guy. He won five of six that he took on Saturday night, which I know at times he kind He's of had. He's a face-off guy. He's had bad showings, and we've always been like, Wait, this is he's a, he's a face-off guy. Five of six. Why is he not taking defensive well, zone draws, especially late in the period? Even if it's like say, what, Miko Koivu, what Miko Koivu used to do where it's like, we have to have a guy go out there and take the draw, and then he's bolting off immediately once they win it in game possession. That is, you know, idea. but 
and and Boldy wasn't as bad as maybe we're talking about. It, well, that one just sticks out. Ones, though. But he but he won six of thirteen. Like he was just under five hundred. Yeah. So it's well, he's a good player. Right. Like like yes. I I do think we got too hung up on that was a terrible move. Like it wasn't a terrible move. Um, and they were trying. I think in retrospect, Hines was trying to, and I like this spread the scoring around a bit. Now, putting Eck with uh, Boldy tomorrow and Kaprizov will not spread the scoring ar- around, but I think that that line also from 2023-24 had a track record of success where it's like, no, th- these guys can score. So I like mm. the fact that John Hines tries things. I like the fact that, that he makes a- adjustments in game. You know what else I like, Age? I, I like the fact that you can stop at Parlor Bar in St. Paul before a wild game because it's the perfect place to stop. Uh, on West 7th in St. Paul, right down the street from the, the X. Uh, D- Don and I went there about a month ago or so. Absolutely outstanding. The parlor burger is fantastic. Uh, a specialty menu for game day available three hours before the game. You can get lunch served 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Wednesday through Friday. A great brunch on the weekends. Also open 4 to 10 p.m. on Monday and Tuesday. 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. on Wednesday through, through Sunday. But if you're going to go to a wild game at the X, don't forget ideal spot to stop. Parlor bar, uh, pregame, family gatherings, special occasions. Located again, right down West West 7th, excuse me, in St. Paul from the X checkout parlor bar. All right, so they've got, what, a three-game trip now coming up. You got the Blues coming up on Tuesday, and then yep. you go out West. You play the Oilers, who are a uh, bit of an odd team again. I don't get them. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I mean, Connor McDavid's great. Dreisaitl's great. They get off to the terrible start, blow out their coach a year ago. They end up going to Stanley Cup Finals. Then they get off to a terrible start again. Clearly, though, a threat. Um, here's what I like. I like the fact that, just like you said about Gustafson at the outset of this show, I like the fact that it feels like this team is in a spot where injuries are not, for the most part, you know what you're going to get. A year ago, I feel like if that game had been played against Dallas at the same time, even at home, with the three <laughs> guys out, I don't think it's two, two to one. I think the wild gets waxed. And that's largely with the same team. Yeah. Now the goaltender, now the goaltender playing well is huge. Don't get me wrong. That's the definite starting point to what you talked about. But other than that, I also just felt like I love the fact that this team came out in the third and went to work. It felt like they had more life. Yes. Yes. But it didn't feel like a furious rally. It felt like they, they were being businesslike. It didn't mm-hmm. feel like this last gasp of, oh my God, we really should come back because I think to be that you're ordinarily down by like three goals, right? Yeah. And you might cut it to one and then you're like, but we came back. We were within a goal. In this case, it was a very tight game and it felt like the wild went to work. I just think there's more of a professional approach right now than I have seen in a while. I think you're exactly right. Like the, that, it's weird to describe it that way because there's no other way to do it than the furious rally, I guess, m- mantra that that you've put forth. But right. there's a different feeling. It's not uh, the other, you know, Dallas was up by two or three and maybe they got a little comfy and all of a sudden, you know, they start sitting back. So the Wild take advantage and, hey, they pot one, they pot two, they they lose by two empty net goals. Like, oh, hey, you know, we, we came back, we made it a game. No, but you were out of it the entire time. They were already shorthanded by the game's begin. They give up a goal late in the first. For the most part, they lock things down in the second period. They have a couple chances, one of which Matt Boldy had a broken stick on what I would assume would have been a goal because it was a very nice feed across. Um, Jake Middleton at one point off of a Marco Rossi feed um, on a zone entry. I think Faber also hit the post, but it was Jake Middleton who hit the far side post that you and I at the moment thought caught the inside netting and bounced out. That's right. Yep. Yeah. They, they didn't, yeah, they, they but, had the chances. And like you said, it was business. Like it was, we know our plan can work. We just, it wasn't really clicking in the third period. It seemed like it started to finally work. And granted it did pick up after the, uh, the stars went up to nothing, but it, they, they just have a different attitude. Like the, the yeah. mindset is not, we, you know, we're going to crawl back in because we want to. It's, we should be in the game already. 
let's keep doing what we're doing. Here's my favorite thing as, as we approach um, the end of November into to December. My favorite thing about the Wild is this. They play a style with or without their top guys, and Kaprizov is the linchpin. He's there. That's huge. Yeah. But with the goaltending, with Gustafson playing like he is currently, they play a style that very much could be plopped into the playoffs and can work. Mm-hmm. I can't say that for a lot of their teams. They've had points before. They made the playoffs a lot before. But I, there's been a lot of those teams where I'm like, okay, let's see. You know, in November, go ahead, knock yourself out. You might win these games. But if you play the style in April, you're dead. Or May, you're dead. The Wild plays a style now, starting with the fact that Gustafson's been great. And by the way, the penalty kill now is play is re- has been really solid. Your, your astute points on JHS last week, I think, ha- have proven absolutely true. There is no question they are putting more pressure now on the man with the puck. Uh, but they are they are transitioning or have transitioned to a game that if you plopped it into the spring, I think it actually works. And that, to me, is the most important thing. And I think it's a combo of that and my, and frankly, I think your reassurance of the new coach. I had a li- listener, Liam, DM me on Twitter over the weekend and brought this point up, but he, he would, and I'm sure we'll dig into this later in the season more, but right now, if you are in a playoff battle, a, a, a first round matchup where maybe you take game one, you lose two games in a row because the other team has figured you out. I am confident that John Hines is going to go back to the drawing board, yeah, realize yeah. what has been taken care of, and find ways to adjust and exploit what the other team is now wow. trying to do. And whether it's line Great combinations, point. whether it's strategy, I feel a lot more confident that John Hines will do something like that than what we've seen. I think it was three years ago when Flurry was still with uh, Vegas, that first round matchup where the Wild were, and I felt like in the driver's seat, and all of a sudden, loss, 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 can't, can't do anything about it because... Dean Evison just didn't make any adjustments. Just nothing. Nope. John well, that, Hines, that I think, is... That was Dean's problem. Yes, big time. That was Dean's problem through the... Um, was it two years ago now against Dallas? When, yeah, and, and the Dallas one, yeah. When what Gus stood on his head in, like, game one was unbelievable, and then they just went to Flurry in game two. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> but but I, I would say this, too. I would say and we've seen signs of this as well, I think that there is a fighting chance that Hines would actually adjust in-game, which becomes the most oh. important thing. Yeah. Like, can you adjust between periods? Can you adjust in-game? And he can do that. But, yeah, we. Uh, it's interesting because we – was it Dallas or St. Louis? Somebody made a pretty big adjustment against the Wild in a playoff series, and it made the, all the difference – and the Wild really did nothing about it. And it's like, hold on a second. This this whole professional sports is all about adjustments. So, yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. John Hines, I, I think we. it's safe to say the guy is a tactician. Like, I don't know if it's going to end up resulting in a lot. He, you know, he's been in Jersey before. He's been in Nashville before. So he's essentially falls into the largely recycled category welcome to the National Hockey League. But I think that there is enough tactician things where it gives you hope that if somebody does something, John Hines wouldn't sit there and say, oh my God, this goes against our plan. What are we going to do? And to your point, I think it was the 2022 playoffs. They match up in the first round against St. Louis. That's At crazy. home, Brutal. they host, they fall 4 nothing in uh, in game one. Yep. They were spawned the next night with three goals in the first period in route of a 6-2 win. They yep. go to St. Louis, win 5-1. Yep. Drive receipt. Yep. Like you you've now taken a game on the road, you're up 2-1. 5-2 loss, 5-2 loss, 5-1 loss. Season over. Didn't Series Binnington, over. Didn't Bruby plug Biddington back into net too and, yeah. and he yeah. absolutely and, and he had been a mess. He had been a mental mm-hmm. mess and he stood on on his head. I if I'm not mistaken, Jake Allen, who had basically won the series against Allen, the Allen. Wild when Mike Yo was there, I think he got the start in the series, didn't mm-hmm. play great, and Baruby, without hesitation, said, screw it, went to Bennington. So, yeah, those, like, and, well, and yes, that, 
yes, it's logical, but I, that was not. I mean, how does Philip Gustafson stand on his head in game one against, he made like 50 saves against the Stars. And then you're yep. like, yeah, but this is how we rotate. Yeah, three two win, and then yep, let's go to Flurry in game two, seven to three loss at Dallas. Yep. It, yeah, it's and I love you know Flower. I love it. I love him. He's great to cover. But, but for a but for a franchise that I feel like season after season always yep. talks about riding the hot hand, going to the hot goaltender. So when the most important time of the season right. comes around, you go away from that well, mantra. And that's why you have to juggle Whatever. minds when things mm -hmm. don't work. That's why that's why things have to be changed up. And yes, Dean did not like that. And I think that from what I've heard behind the scenes, I think Dean was considered a tactician compared to Bruce, you know, because Bruce was a lot of, I mean, Boudreau was great. I loved him, but yeah. I don't think he was seen as a tactician. So now you've got a guy who actually has a better idea probably of adjustments, which I think that we see consistently. And in the third period against the stars, we saw that and it damn near worked. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hey, but before we... We go, age. throw that graphic up because it's Give to the Max Week and all week long on the Score North family of podcasts, we'll be throwing our weight and support behind the bond between formerly secondhand hounds. The bond between is a one-of-a-kind animal well-being organization. Since 2009, the bond between has rescued over 30,000 dogs and cats, thanks largely to the support of your donation. Thanks to our friends at Nutrisource for kicking us off with a $2,000 match. Nutrisource will be matching the first $2,000 that we raise for the bond between. We at Score North are also giving away at random 15 purple daily beanies to those who donate in any amount via a random draw. Just go to scorenorth.com uh, backslash donate, scorenorth.com backslash donate to help us give to the max and who wouldn't love that puppy oh that's an adorable puppy we all love our dogs absolutely so, a great cause the bond between uh and score north uh getting together for give to the max speaking of giving to the max judd's hockey show tomorrow will be giving to the max because it'll be aj jesse pierce and yours truly setting up things again for a uh a trip that the wild is about to go on plenty to like about this team we will see you tomorrow